Stand with me, would you please, as we read the first six verses. John 4, Luke 14, verse 1, on one Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Father, we ask, would you please clarify this word to us today, help us to know what it means, and then help us to know how you would have us apply it to our lives. We pray this for the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> if I ask a question this morning and said something like this, what, what is the one thing that will keep more people out of heaven than any other? And you know, I know the first controversy as well, isn't everybody going to heaven? The Bible's answer, beloved, is no. Everybody isn't. I know at the funerals it sounds like it, but they don't all go. So what is it that was, would be the one thing that keeps more people out of heaven than anything else? What one thing? I can tell you without reservation what I think that one thing is. It's people's good works. It's our good works. Most people are counting on their goodness to get them there. And the Bible is absolutely unequivocal. It gets used to teach that, and it doesn't. It unequivocally teaches the opposite. The Bible teaches in Titus 3.5 that he saved us not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy. The Bible teaches in Ephesians 2.9 that it is not of works, lest any man should boast. Good works become ghastly works when someone is counting on them to earn favor with God. So if you want to think of it that way, the title of the sermon is Good Works or Ghastly Works. The truth is they're the same thing. The same goodness that you do in your life, the same good works that you think you are accomplishing could be good or they could be ghastly, the difference being the motivation. Good works become ghastly when we think we are earning God's favor with them rather than expressing gratitude for what we've already received. Someone has said this, they've said good works are like wearing a hospital gown you're never as covered as you think you are. <laughs> I haven't had that privilege. I hope I never had that privilege, but to wear a hospital gown we know is like that. Good works are like that. Good works are great, beloved. They're, in fact, they're not just great, they're necessary for demonstrating true saving faith. But they are absolutely useless to provide a cover for sin. So if what motivates the good work is the thought that by this act I will somehow earn God's favor, it becomes a ghastly act because it is not doing what I think it's doing. It can't. None of us can buy God off. There's not enough coverage to do that. So those who believe that they can we would call moralists or legalists, people trying to earn God's favor. To them, life is like a big accounting system. I do good things in order to put God under obligation to me. When I kind of step off the wagon for a little bit, I lose points 
but I earn them back by doing extra credit later on. You see the system, right? I dare say it's been a part of many of our thoughts for a long, long time. But that's moralism, the belief that somehow I can make God owe me something. And that's the problem that Jesus is addressing in this passage. He's addressing the problem of moralists. And what he's trying to show them is that they always come up short. Their books are going to say one thing. God's books, which are the only one that counts, God's books say something entirely different. And so it's so important to understand the solution to sin is not moralism. The solution to sin is repentance. To throw ourselves on the mercy of God, not to think we can earn the mercy of God. Now in this passage, to help us understand that basic truth, three ways in which moralists fall short. Three reasons that moralism is deficient. Number one, moralists lack comprehension. Moralists lack comprehension. The main reason for this is because they have the wrong starting point. The starting point for moralism, the starting point for moralists is human wisdom. It's what seems right. It's what feels right. It's what they pick out of the Bible by picking the places that are talking about how a person should act once they are saved instead of how they should act to get saved. So they rely on their human intellect, on their own reasoning rather than God's revelation. It's a very, 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 very common issue in our day and time. Now the background of this passage, we saw, you can see in verse one, one Sabbath day, Jesus is invited to lunch at the home of a leading Pharisee. Sounds like a very friendly start, right? I want you to notice, as we've seen throughout the book of Luke, Jesus often went to lunch at the home of the Pharisees, these ones who were increasingly more in opposition to him. He was taking the gospel where it needed to go the most. And so he welcomed any opportunity to come. Now, almost always the meal turned (laughs) antagonistic before it got all done because he was always faithful to the truth. But he goes to this lunch. And it sounds like a friendly start. Jesus invited, he goes. It's all nice and warm and cozy, right? But ominously, at the end of verse one, we see this. They were watching him carefully. So the first question that pops into our mind is they who? And it doesn't really tell us, the Bible doesn't really say, so we could surmise that it's other Pharisees or like-minded friends of this man who has invited Jesus to come for lunch. They are watching him carefully. Now, why are they watching him carefully? Because they revere him? Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. The context here helps us understand this because see, Jesus Jesus is just, we've just seen at the end of chapter 13 how Jesus was mourning over the city of Jerusalem, brought tears to his eyes as he thought about what, how he wanted to gather them and they would not, how they were rejecting him, how they were rejecting his message of repentance. And so after Luke has given us that account, he gives us a real life example of that. Do you see? That's why the context always helps us understand what's going on. Here's a real life example of rejection leading to destruction. So when Luke says they were watching him carefully, and the word carefully there means ominously or skeptically or lurkingly, they were watching him carefully. It's not for a good purpose, it's a trap. And in fact, the very next verse helps us understand by what means they hoped to trap him. It says, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. Okay, so what is dropsy? Dropsy is a buildup of fluid in the body. Any of you who have been sick or been in the hospital for a while may have faced this. It's usually caused, this buildup is caused by something else. Could be cancer could be some problem with the liver or with the kidneys, which would lead to this buildup. Could be heart problems. Any of those could cause it. Usually, it's a pretty serious problem. 
So as we begin to get fluid build up in the body, we want to try and get rid of it. So this guy has some serious problem that's led to this buildup of fluid. We don't know what it is. Next question is, well, was he an invited guest or was he just one of those, as, as we've seen before, it wasn't unusual for the average citizen to come when they knew there was a big feast, a big banquet going on at someone's house, a big wig in the community who had a big courtyard, they could come and they could actually sit in the courtyard and kind of observe the banquet, listen in on the conversation. I guess this is what you did before television, I don't know, to go to these banquets. And so he, that people would routinely do this and perhaps he's that way or perhaps, and I think more likely in this case, he's actually been invited to this party because they have a purpose for him. What they're doing, either way, whichever is correct, whether he's invited or not, the Pharisees, when they see him, they spotlight him. They put him somewhere where Jesus can't miss him. And so they're just throwing the spotlight on this guy because he's a needy person. And what they're hoping is that Jesus will do what, I, what he always does when he sees needy people, that he will heal him because then they can accuse him of violating their Sabbath. It's all a setup. They want to see Jesus do this so that they can accuse him of violating the Sabbath regulations. Jesus sees right through the ruse. In one way, it's not that hard. Jesus knew the theology of the Pharisees, and he knew that their theology said if somebody has a disability like this, it's because they have done some sin. There is something wicked in their life. That's the only reason that this would happen. So they were not routinely invited to the parties of the Pharisees. So when Jesus sees that this man is not only here, but he's being accepted, in fact, he's being more or less thrust forward, it doesn't take long to understand what's going on. Jesus sees right through them, through him. They've placed him so that Jesus will do what they think Jesus will do. And of course, Jesus does. Jesus sees with compassion. They were right in that identification of Jesus. Jesus is compassionate. They're seeing nothing but rules. Jesus sees human need. That's one way you can tell a moralist, by the way. It's one way you can examine your own heart. Are you, are you a rules-oriented person or are you a people-oriented person? Now, we're all different. And I'm not suggesting we should all be exactly the same, but beloved, when it comes to human need, it takes precedent over the rules. That's how you know whether there's a moralist here, but that's how these guys have set the trap, because they're just moralists. Even as they're passing the potatoes, they're watching carefully to see what Jesus is going to do, hoping against hope that he'll do what they think he will do. So then we get to verse 3. We get to verse 3, and it says, And Jesus responded to the, to the lawyers and Pharisees. Jesus responds. To what? No, nobody's said anything yet. Not that we know of, not that's given in the text. So what is it that Jesus is responding to? Well, what he's responding to, beloved, is the situation. He's responding to what he sees as the trap that they've intended. And in one question, he's going to absolutely dash their hopes. Jesus responded. And they were not going to like the response that he gives because look at the question. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He knows what they expect of him. He knows why the man has been put there and spotlighted for him. He knows why this has been set up for him. And so he says, I think I'll ask a question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He doesn't ask, is it a compassionate thing to do? That could have led to a long argument, but he just says, is it lawful? That's kind of a yes or no answer, right? Is it lawful? And their response is very telling. What's their response? They remained silent. <laughs> Why did they remain silent? How come they have no response to his question? That's well, pretty obvious, isn't it? Jesus has put them on the horns of a great dilemma. If they say, of course, it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath, then they have no recourse when Jesus heals the man. They have nothing they can say, right? They've already agreed that it would be okay. But if they say, no, it's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath, now they're the bad guys 
And Jesus, who they were trying to put on in a bad light, turns out to be the good guy. Jesus had him in a great bind already. But beloved, the, the, the bind goes even deeper than that, really. Jesus, at another level, has them on a deeper issue because when Jesus said, is it lawful, they understood and everybody who was there understood that, that Jesus was talking about, is it lawful according to the law of God? According to the law of God given through Moses, written down in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament as the Jews understood it, is it lawful there to heal on the Sabbath? Does God's law have anything to say about that? And also everybody there knew, no, the law doesn't have anything to say about that. The law doesn't define healing on the Sabbath as being wrong. There's nothing in the Mosaic law given by God to prohibit someone from healing on the Sabbath. Nothing. The only thing that would be violated by healing on the Sabbath was the, own, was, was, was the, was the rules and the traditions and everything that the Pharisees had added to the law to make it favorable to them. That's the only thing that would be violated. Healing would violate them, not God. By this one question, Jesus has pointed out a major issue of all moralists. They lack comprehension. Why? Because they reject the law of God in favor of their own interpretation. When you do that, beloved, you, under, you, you, you misunderstand. You lack comprehension. You, ca you, you lack understanding. That's what the, why the New Testament so often speaks of those who are outside of Christ being blinded. They can be the most brilliant person in the world, but if they do not have the Holy Spirit ministering the word of God to them, they are blinded. And that's the state that these Pharisees were in. For them, it's about a religion that they have defined, not about a revelation that God has defined, a relationship that God has defined. They turn God's word into a list of do's and don'ts. That's all it means to them. It's all about outward compliance with this great list that they've created rather than the living invitation that the Bible has always been intended to be. Now some of you may be saying, well, wait a minute. Aren't the Ten Commandments in the law of God? That sounds kind of like a list, doesn't it? And the answer is yes, of course. It is a list and it is in the law of God. But beloved, that list was never given in order to save anyone. It was never given as the means by which we would come to salvation, which is what the Pharisees were treating it as. And the reason they were making their own traditions is because they knew they couldn't keep those 10 commandments. So they defined them in ways that they could keep them. But that's not why they were there. They were there in the first place to point up the need for salvation they were there to point out the fact that we can't keep them. They were there to point out that we fall short of God's character and God's glory because the Ten Commandments were never just a list. They're a definition of God's character. God didn't sit down one day and say, I think I'll make up this list. He sat down one day and said, I think I'll explain to men who I am. That's what they're about. And they missed all of that. They lack comprehension. Turn to Galatians 3 with me. Galatians 3. If you're in Luke, you go to John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and then Galatians. Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Here's what the Bible has to say about the list. See, the Bible never, ever says be saved by keeping this list. It's not there. It's not what it teaches. In fact, it teaches exactly the opposite. Look at this in Galatians 3. Let's read verse 10. Galatians 3 and verse 10. Paul says this. He says, For all who rely on works of the law 
are under salvation. Is that what it says? It says, if you, want to, if you want to rely on the works of the law, you're under a curse. You're under a curse. And then he explains why. He says, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. What he's saying is, you, you, if you want to rely on works of the law, good luck, because all you have to do in order to be saved is keep them all perfectly, all the time, never a mistake. Which means that by the time you read this, you're already sunk, right? Because you've already failed the law time after time after time after time. Those who will be saved by keeping the law are under a curse. You don't get saved by keeping the list, beloved. You get cursed by keeping the list for the wrong reason because you can't do it. But the moralist never delves deeply enough into the Word of God to figure that out. He never allows himself to be available to the Holy Spirit to open the Word of God to him so he can know this. He never realizes that he is most cursed not by his wickedness or sin, but by his goodness. Let me say that again. He doesn't realize, the moralist doesn't realize that he is most cursed, not by his good work, uh, bad works, but by his good works. You say, how could that possibly be? Motivation. If the motive for good works is to earn God's favor, you have a ghastly work on your hands. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 3, 24. If we can't be saved by keeping the law, then how are we saved? Romans 3, 24. Paul says this, he says, we are justified declared righteous, saved, any one of those terms you want to use, redeemed, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's not a redemption that's in you or a redemption that's in me. It's a redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And the way I get it is by, as a gift of grace, I love how the King James phrases this. It says, we are justified freely by his grace. Freely by his grace. Someone says, but I must have to do something. Surely I have to be, you know, holy for, if, if I'm just holy for most of my life, surely that will be good enough. And the Bible says, no, it's freely by his grace. Someone says, but I know deep within me that I have, to, I have to be good. That's what I have to do. If my good, if I can just make my good outweigh my bad, if I can just do more good things than bad things, then I'm okay. And the Bible says, no, it's freely by his grace. Someone says, if I just go through this ritual, if I just do this thing, if I just get on my knees and go from the 900 miles from wherever it is in Spain that people go on this pilgrimage, if I just do that, and the Bible says, no, it's freely by his grace. So hard to get through. Spurgeon says this, he says, if you bring any of your deservings, you shall not have it. God gives away his justification freely and if you bring anything to pay for it, he will throw it in your face. That's what the Bible teaches. Your deservings ruin everything. It is freely by his grace. You know, if I could preach that you could be saved by giving $10, we'd have a big offering this morning, right? You'd all walk out justified. If I could preach that you would be saved by walking 100 miles, you'd start this afternoon, would you not? If I preached that you could make heaven by going through some prescribed ritual, Name whatever one you like. 
you'd line up right now to go do that thing, right? But why is it when the Bible says freely, 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 freely by His grace, people turn away? I don't know. But I know it's a form of moralism because moralism says I have to earn it. Moralism says I can put God under my obligation, I can, under, under, under obligation to me. I can make an account sheet that says I'm more good than I am bad and God's going to have to accept that. And moralism kills for lack of comprehension because that's wrong. Moralists lack comprehension. Secondly, moralists lack compassion. More or less lack compassion. Some of us, unfortunately, even as believers, are more moralists than we realize. We lack compassion. The Pharisees have no response to Jesus' question, so Jesus goes ahead and heals the man, and then he sends him on his way. He's been used enough. He's been humiliated enough. Jesus graciously re- excuses him from this company but knowing full well that the Pharisees are going to be offended by what he's just done. He has another question for them. This one is intended to demonstrate and to show the hypocrisy that's part of who they are. And so he he says this in verse 5, he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. No reply. Why? Because they knew he was right. He was right. Jesus' point is that despite their long list of do's and don'ts, which they willingly apply to other people, they give themselves waivers. They get free passes. So they apply little things to other people. For example, they told the tailor, you you cannot work on the Sabbath, and that means you can't even carry around the pins that you pin cloth with on the Sabbath. You can't do that. That's work. There'll be no working on the Sabbath. There'll be no carrying pins around. There'll be no travel on the Sabbath. That means 200 yards away from your home. There'll be no travel. You cannot leave home. There'll be no cooking for the housewives on the Sabbath. You've got to fix it all the day before whatever, in order to get around that. But, you know, if we have a, an ox or a child fall in a well, we can do that. Well, wait a minute. Isn't that more work than cooking a meal? Isn't that more work than carrying around this little pin? Yes, but this is for our benefit. They were hypocrites. And what Jesus is pointing out is the hypocrisy of their system that for their own benefit, If a son or an ox fell in a well, they would pull him out. Open wells were a constant problem in that ancient country. A child or even an animal seeking water might easily fall into one. Would it be work to get them out? Could be, could possibly be pretty intense work to get them out. I mean, a child is one thing. Imagine pulling an ox out of the well, right? A lot of work attaches to that. And Jesus' point is, but for your own benefit, you'll do it. The small print on your, what you think is your contract with God says, okay, you can, pull the, you can pull the animal out. But here's a man who is disabled, who is sick to death, and you're telling me that to heal him on the Sabbath would be work. And the truth is, if you look at what I did to heal that man, there is almost no discernible work that goes along with it, and yet you condemn me for that. Well, you pull the animals out of the well. That great work. You're just hypocrites. That's what he's showing them. And he's not showing them so that he can accuse them. He's showing them to invite them to see who they are so that they can repent so that their hearts can be right with God, so that they can have the gift of salvation that he offers. That's why he's pointing this out. But they have to understand the hypocrisy that's just part of who they are. They knew because sometimes when Jesus asked this question, they would answer this way. They knew that the law could be summed up in two commands, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What Jesus is pointing out here is, number one, you don't love God because you're amending his revelation. You're making it say whatever you want it to say for your benefit. You don't love God because you're not listening to him. And you don't love your neighbor because when I heal your neighbor who is 
at, at virtually no labor and who is in danger of death, you condemn me while you pull the animals out of the well to your favor. You don't love your neighbor. You don't love God. You're not keeping the law that you think you're keeping. You're just hypocrites. They think themselves better than others. They use others. Moralists always compare. Find yourself comparing a lot? Be careful. It's a moralistic trait. Moralists have to compare. Why? Because, they, because their salvation depends on it. If you ask a moralist, why do you think you should go to heaven? Why are you saved? What is it that would save you? What is it that would make you right with God? They would respond, it's because I'm as good as anybody I know and better than most. So I have to be constantly comparing myself to make sure that I'm staying ahead of the game so that I can be saved. Salvation depends on looking down on others. Their salvation depends on condescending to others. This is why, beloved, the Pharisees hated the common people. They looked down on them. The people looked up to them because they thought they were so holy, but they looked down on them because their salvation depended on being better. Modern moralists are a little more subtle perhaps, but no less doing the same thing comparing themselves to others, using people. More or less lack like compassion. There's a um, computer science professor, his name is Randy Bausch. He writes articles every once in a while. He's kind of renowned within his field, very smart guy. So naturally he's a PhD. And people, you know, revere him. They, people that are kind of in that science community, that computer science community, think a lot of him. His mother is not impressed. His mother routinely introduces him as, this is my son. He's a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. He's a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. That would be a great definition of a moralist. Moralists are religionists, but not the kind that help people. Unless it somehow benefits them. They don't help people, they use people. Moralists are users because they have no compassion. And so their good works, beloved, are in danger of taking them to an eternity separated from God. Because they have misunderstood what it's all about. Moralists lack compassion. Thirdly, moralists lack Christ. This is the biggest one, of course. Moralists lack Christ. These, me these men are not accepting Christ. They're not believing him. They're part of the crowd that John identified when he said in John 1 11, Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. Here are some of those who received him not. They are not revering him. They're not listening to him. They're not really even enjoying fellowship with him. They brought him to the meal so that they could find a way to condemn him. They are judging Jesus, not believing him. And if you remember right, we've seen before, Jesus didn't come to be judged. He came to be believed. I'll tell you what, the first time he didn't come to judge. He came to save. He didn't come to condemn people. He came that through his message of repentance they might be saved. But they have to decide. And so in the end, by far the greatest lack that these men had was they lacked Christ. They lacked the only one who could save them. Moralists today will talk about Christ. They're not quite as, they're not quite, they're, they, typically, they're not quite as adamant in their rejection of Christ. They will talk about him. They will talk about what a great guy he was, what a nice prophet, what a wonderful example. But to have any personal claim or personal relationship with him, they have, you know how you can tell a moralist, if Jesus had never been born, 
It wouldn't matter to them. It wouldn't matter to them. Their whole goal in life is to be better than the next guy so that hopefully God will accept them someday. Their salvation is their list of do's and don'ts. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. If Jesus is a great example, fine. But if Jesus had never been born, they'd find some other example. Jesus didn't come, beloved, to be a great example only. He didn't come to be looked up to as a great prophet or a wonderful man. He came to make a claim on your life. It's the only means of salvation. It's the only means of salvation. You want to see a moralist? Look at Luke 18. Luke 18. Here's a moralist. You know, the, the problem is we've read this story so many times, we, we miss the point because it's common. But Jesus is going to compare here a Pharisee and a tax collector. And what you have to understand is the audience in Jesus' time looked down on the tax collector as being absolutely rubbish, white trash or worse. They looked up to the Pharisee as being the righteous, holy, someone to be revered. And so when Jesus uses this parable and starts it out this way, they, his audience would have thought the Pharisee is going to be the hero, the tax collector is the villain. Look at it. Luke 18, beginning in verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The audience has already decided who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. Pharisee's the good guy, the tax collector's the bad guy. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortionist, unjust, adulterers, or even the, like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Now, because we know the end of the story, we don't realize this sounds exactly like a lot of prayers in our churches. Do you realize that? God, thank you that we accepted you 30 years ago and we got our life straightened out and we raised our kids and one of them is a, is a missionary in Africa and thank you and and, 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 and we worked hard and we got this great job and so we give tithes and we come to the church and we even give beyond the tithes occasionally. We give to the building fund and you know what we're doing there. Are those things wrong? No. Not unless you're counting on them for your salvation. Then they are ghastly wrong. We think we're not Pharisees. I'm not sure. Look what verse 13, with the tax collector standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And look at Jesus' verdict. Verse 14, and I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Who got saved? Not the guy who did everything right. Not the guy who thanked God but then listed his list of credentials. God wasn't saved. Guy wasn't justified. Thought he was. Society thought he was. Everybody thought he was. But who was justified? The guy who never got anything right. But the guy who threw himself on God's mercy. He got Christ. The other one went away open-handed, uh, empty-handed. Do you have Christ? That's the question. Not how you doing on your list of do's and don'ts, but do you have Christ? What's going to keep more people out of heaven than anything? Their good works. Good works. It's made ghastly because we trust them for salvation. Christian Smith, the sociologist, wrote a book in which he identifies a very famous book now in the early 2000s in which he identified the religion of America, religion of the United States, the place in which we live. He identified it this way. He said, what, what our religion is, is moralistic, therapeutic deism. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. By that he meant our religion is, I'm going to do everything right, 
God to me as a therapist will do whatever I need, give me whatever I need whenever I come to him, which is very, not very often, but whenever I do, he's obligated to give me whatever I need. And it's deistic in the sense that God isn't really involved in my life at all unless occasionally I ask him to do something and then he's at my disposal. Moralistic, therapeutic deism, that's who we are. And he's right. And he quotes a young boy, a 15-year-old boy from Mississippi to illustrate the moralistic part of this, just one of many quotes he has in the book. But this boy said this, he said, if you do the right thing and don't do anything bad, I mean nothing really bad, you know, you go to heaven. If you don't, well, then you're screwed. <laughs> That's about it. Sounds like be good for goodness sake, doesn't it? It's Christmas. Beloved. Jesus is teaching us it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, you know, Jesus. The Bible teaches there is none righteous, no, not one. If we get to heaven by being good, God's verdict is going to be everybody out. Because you pollute my heaven with your goodness. Thankfully, Jesus came to fix what we can't, right? Sign in a plumber's office said, uh, said, we fix what your, we repair what your husband fixed. Any, any, any of you ladies relate to that? We repair what your husband fixed. See, that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to repair what we thought we fixed with our good works, but which could never get us there. Ever. That's what Jesus came to do. It's by grace, through faith, Jesus came to turn ghastly good works, those intended to earn favor with God, into good, good works. Those done out of gratitude, a heart of gratitude for what Jesus has already done for us. So question this morning, we have to all ask ourselves, am I a moralist? Trusting in my own goodness? Or am I a believer trusting in his goodness? See, we can never be good enough, beloved. But he already was. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of salvation, for the gift of your righteousness. We're clothed in your righteousness. It's not like a hospital gown. It's the real thing. We're covered completely. And so we thank you that what we could never fix, what we could never do on our own, that what we could only mess up, what we could only turn into something ghastly has been turned into something good by you. And so we pray that our hearts are open. Lord, we pray that we're receiving the gift of life that you give us. We pray that having received it, we are humbled to the point where we'd never think of advertising our goodness, but that we would rejoice in your goodness. May it be true of us, each one I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.